Yes? Mr. Drew Pearson on 9 0. All right, tell him I have a bunch of folks with me, but that you're going to put me through, but he'll have to do most of the talking. Thank you. Mr. Pearson? Yeah. He has a lot of folks with him. We're going to put you through, but you might be expected to do most of the talking, and he'll just do the listening, all right? Thank well, you, I, just I, a moment. I can, uh, I can, I don't have to talk to him now. But, but you, is it better? Hello? Yes, sir. All right. Do you, uh, would it be better for me to call back later? Let me check, just a moment. Yes? He asked if it'd be better for him to call back later. Tell him I've got him all day long. Just tell him no. Tell him I've got security counsel right after this. Got the British foreign minister and others and uh, uh, the leadership that this is just the worst day of the year for me. And everybody has to do it right now. And I'll be on in just a minute. Thank you. Mr. Pearson? Yeah. He says he can't think of any time. The day looks pretty rough. So if you'll just hold on, he'll be right with you. All right. Thank you. tell you what I told them last night, and uh, it wasn't on the record, and I wouldn't want this to be on the record, but I think that uh, Some of them if, told. if Some you of them could told use me. it discreetly, I yeah. think it would be, uh, I think it uh, might be helpful to you. Yeah, all right. I said that uh, uh, weekend, uh, uh, Eisenhower went in there in 54, and he pledged those people that he would help them. Yeah. The Congress came along and ratified that in 55 by a vote of 82 to 1, which said that when any uh, country in that area is attacked or faced with aggression, that we'll come to their rescue. That was a CETO treaty, and there's only one person that uh, voted against it, 82 to 1, in the Senate. Uh, that was before I became president, and that's Eisenhower's commitment. He had hundreds of people in there. Kennedy came along. He studied it. He reaffirmed the commitment, although he had to keep the treaty, just like a, a treaty. If we, if we don't have it there, we don't have it in Berlin, we don't have it any place. Uh, it's not worth a dime. And the first to announce it would be the Russians if we broke the test ban, or the uh, French if we the Gaul would be right down our neck if we broke any treaties. And besides, a hundred little countries like Greece and Turkey looked at us in the Truman Doctrine that are watching to see if if we can help hold this little country from aggressors, that maybe they got a hope. If they, if we can't hold them, well, then they'll all be gobbled up as Hitler gobbled up the low countries. And we don't want to have another Munich, and I don't want to be another Chamberlain. So I came in and said, uh, Taft uh, said that he wouldn't uh, disagree with Roosevelt, what he's doing in Korea, but he did it the wrong way, that he ought to be in on the takeoffs if he's going to be in on the landings, and Congress ought to be asked for its expression. So I went to Congress and said, you give me your views. And the Congress in August uh, of last year passed a resolution uh, saying that uh, I should protect against all aggressors and use all the power that uh, necessary and all the power of the United States forces. So I read them that. Now, there are people that want us to pull out. Uh, Morse is one, and others say, well, you can have a military solution and, and this and that. Uh, 
We have to analyze that. Let's put it under a microscope. I got a treaty, 82 to 1. I got a resolution, 502 to 2. And that resolution says that the Congress approves and supports the determination of the President to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack and to prevent further aggression. And the United States is prepared to take all necessary steps as the President determined, including the use of all armed forces necessary to assist any member or protocol state of the Southeast Asia Defense Treaty. So Congress did that in August. Uh, they did it in 55, 82 to 1. They did it in August this year, 502 to 2. So I don't much believe I can break her commitment. I don't bleach, I can walk out. I think if they did, they'd take Thailand. I think they'd take Cambodia. I think they'd take Burma. I think they'd take Indonesia. I think they'd take India. I think they'd come right back and take the Philippines, and I think we'd be home. And I think I'd be another Chamberlain, and I think we'd have another Munich. And I think aggressors uh, feed on blood and uh, uh, so forth. So that's number one. I'm not coming home. Now, they may get another president, but I'm not going to pull out. Now, the second thing is negotiation. That's the second course. Uh, negotiation, I had said in every state of the Union, in 40 different speeches, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll see anybody that I can do and see in an honorable way to promote peace at any time. Now, I didn't just say the Russians. I didn't just say the British. I didn't just say the French. That said anybody, anywhere, at any time that offers any hope of peace. Okay, now let's see whether I need to go to Hanoi or not. Let's see whether I need to go to Peiping or not. My last intelligence from uh, uh, Hanoi, uh, well, first I'll say from Peiping, it sums up pretty well, and this is a literal quotation. Uh, uh, Bao Zedong says that Emperor Johnson must know that uh, he cannot win at the conference table what he has lost on the battlefield. Now, that's so far, that's pretty strong for China. Sure. And they denounced Russia this morning, yesterday morning, for what they had done. Uh, they not coming in and, uh, and raising more hell themselves. So Hanoi, I got a most recent report, says that they think that the South is crumbling, that they, oh, they will not talk negotiation. They will not have any uh, consideration to it until we pull back to San Francisco, until we get out, until they take over South Vietnam, and they'll be glad to talk. Now, I don't know how you can negotiate when there's nobody who wants to negotiate. We encourage the Russians and the British without weakening our hand, without changing our government, and without letting the South Vietnamese think we were running out. We did everything we could to encourage them to see what they could, what track they could keep open. But they didn't get very far. We have even encouraged the French, who talk big about negotiation, and every time they say, I say, how, they go in and say, well, uh, we're sorry, but uh, when the time's not right, you got to be more militarily strong, more military power. So I can't find anybody to negotiate with. And if I negotiate some, I have no reason to be, believe it'd be any better or stronger than 54 or 62. And they don't keep those. And I don't know how to make it self-enforcing. So it doesn't look to me, unless they leave the people alone, uh, and uh, if they keep spreading aggression, I don't think I can run. And I think I'm committed to defend them. And if they won't negotiate with me, and they say they won't negotiate, and I can't say that I won't negotiate and have them turn me down, it would leave the world in much worse shape. Every negotiation this country's ever had has been a preliminary understanding ahead of time sure. that there was some hope of something coming out of it. So the third thing is the LeMay viewpoint. I can take my bombs, and I can take my nuclear weapons, as Barry says, and I can defoliate, and I can clear out that brush where I can see anybody coming down that line. And I can wipe out Hanoi, and I can wipe out Peiping, and I can wipe out a good deal of their 33 divisions that'd be coming down there. But I think that would start World War III, and I think I'd have seven, 800 million, and I'd have a land war in Asia, and I think I'd have to send three or 400,000 men there. So what I have done, when they have come across the line with their bomb and dropped them in the American compound, 
one or two that didn't explode, I picked them up and put one or two hours with them and take them back where they left that morning to their own compound and dropped them in there. They killed a good deal more people than we did. I haven't bombed any cities. I haven't killed any women and children. I have said I would be appropriate and fitting and measured. And I'm being just as measured as I know how. I don't get in the vicinity of their aircraft. I don't get in the vicinity of their cities. I don't kill their women and children. The uh, people in South Vietnam forces do have some tear gas and nausea bombs. They got them from the French back before they got out of there. They got some from us. Every police chief in the United States has them. Every riot unit we have in the Army has them. When you start riding and tagging over the embassy and coming in, rather than shooting people, you give them something that'll upset the stomach or make them, their eyes blink. And hell, they used them in some a week ago. Now, I, they didn't, I didn't send them out there. They were out there long before I came. I never knew it. I never heard of it. But uh, all this big propaganda they're making about gas, it's not poison gas. It's not war gas. It's the same kind of gas Chief Murray's got right here. If uh, the Negro started moving in the White House and they told them to stop. And it's the same kind. It's used by all riot units and used by Saigon police and used by uh, military police every place. And a matter of fact, we got them down there right now in case the state troopers and the rest of them take in on us in Alabama. There's yeah. nothing new about that. But they play it up. First thing, a damn newspaper man writes a lie. Yeah. He said, I understand you got mustard gas out here. And they said, no, we haven't. Well, tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. The only thing we know anything about is this non-lethal gas, this, uh, this tear gas. Then he writes the story that there's a, well, they say it's non-lethal, but it could make a man's eyes water and it could make him sick. Well, of course it does. That's a lot preferable when the Viet Cong come in and about to blow up uh, the embassy. Sure. We haven't used it. But uh, uh, when Kennedy didn't have it in Jackson, Mississippi, they just raised uncharted hell and he had to move in and fly them in day and night so they could protect our people if we needed to. And we, that's the best way anybody knows, any police squad, to when the mob gets an action, 100,000 people coming at you, turn it loose. Now, we, they have used it once or twice in South Vietnam. I don't know how many times. I never heard of it till last night until I got back. But they're doing everything. This week, it's uh, dropping bombs. The next week, it's poor equipment. The week before, it's uh, inadequate planes. The next week, it's gas. And they, these boys, the propagandists and the communists, are working pretty full string, and they keep us defending all the time, fighting with their own people, trying to explain that we're not warmongers, trying to explain to the Goldwaters and to the Nixons and even to the Lodges and uh, to Rockefeller why we're not dropping bombs up there and why we're not getting closer into their industrial targets. And I have to explain that, that to them and show them that that doesn't do any good. You just kill a bunch of women and children and let's try to deter them. Let's try to prevail on them. Let's do like I do with my daughter Lucy. Let's try to reason with them. Let's be patient. Let's follow what old Ag Harmershaw uh, uh, said just before he died. The qualities peace requires are just those which I feel we all must have today. Perseverance and patience a firm grip on realities, careful but imaginative planning, a clear awareness of the dangers, but also the fact that fate is what we make it. Now, that's what I'm trying to do. So I can't run out. I've got nobody to negotiate with. I don't want to bomb the cities and the towns, and I'm trying to convince them by putting off a pop gun or a firecracker or anything I can to please quit coming in. Sure. That's that simple. And I have said time and time and time again, I repeat to you now, I'll do anything that's honorable. I'll go anywhere. I'll see anybody. I'll make any sacrifice to keep people from being killed. Just like I didn't want to go into Montgomery and Selma. I did everything a human could to avoid it. I got his, I got his, he came up here and I spent three hours with him. But when all said and done, he said to him, he said it, he said it, he said it, he said it.